Okay, trig students, this is chapter three, and section 3.1 here is on quadratics. Um, this is what we spent the very beginning of your Algebra 2 year last year doing. And so we're going to be talking about quadratic functions, and obviously their graphs are parabolas and vertex and max and min and all of that. So this should be a review. Now, I know it's a year or so old, so I'm going to hit some of the high points here, but this should be a review from Algebra 2. Nothing new yet. Um, so this is your assignment or a version of your assignment on WebAssign. I've kind of gone through the assignment and picked some of the examples that I want to do to help jog your memory on quadratics. So here we go. Um, I'm, number one is kind of, I think everyone should get that. You've got a drop down menu there of choices. Um, moving on to number two, the quadratic function f of x equals a comma x minus h squared plus k is in standard form. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. And then I'm going to leave um, answering the question up to you guys, but I do want to jog your memory here. Um, this is considered standard form for a quadratic. The h and the k gives us our vertex, if you guys remember. Now, be careful, not the minus in the parentheses, just the h. Okay, so if you had an x plus h, then it would be a negative h would be your vertex point. Okay, so your vertex is h and k. Um, the a tells you if the a is greater than zero, if it's positive, the parabola points up. If the a is less than zero, the parabola points down. Okay, if you guys can remember that. And and uh, I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but um, if A is a whole number, like the bigger the whole number, the skinnier the parabola is, because the faster the Y value is going to go up. Um, if A is a fraction, like between 0 and 1, the fatter the parabola is going to be, because the slower the Y value is going to go up with relation to the X. So anyway, but... Those are kind of the high points of the standard form of a quadratic function. So just kind of wanted to tell you that. Also, a couple more things when we talk about max and min. Um, if the parabola points up, this would be a minimum value, the vertex. The y value would be the minimum, OK? If a parabola points down, the vertex y value would give you a maximum, OK? So this would be a min. This would be a max, and you guys can just see that. That makes sense, okay? So now, that kind of jogs your memory of quadratics a little bit. Let's move on. Um, so let's just look at number four. So it says the graph of f of x is negative 6, and in parentheses, x minus 9 squared minus 7 is a parabola that opens. This would be down. Okay, how do I know it opens down? Because my 6 is negative out front. My a is less than 0. The vertex would be at the point 9, comma, negative 7. Oh, they already had parentheses there. Sorry. Um, so you would not need the parentheses that I just wrote in the box. You just need the 9, comma, negative 7. Now, remember, when we talk the standard form, the minus is part of the formula. So this is my h and that's my k. Okay, so the negative comes with the 7. It does not come with the 9. Um, and f of 9, it says, equals what? What do I get if I put 9 in in place of x? If I put 9 in place of x, so I would have negative 6, 9 minus 9 squared minus 7. This, of course, is 0. Okay. So negative 6 times 0 squared is just 0. Minus 7 is going to be negative 7. OK, so f of 9 equals negative 7. And that would be the maximum value of f. So if we do this, I assume that's what, yeah. They want maximum or minimum. And how do I know it's a maximum? Because the parabola points down. 
Okay, so again, if I graphed that parabola, the parabola is going to point down. I know that because this is a negative 6. This point right here, the vertex, would be the point 9, negative 7. Okay, negative 7 would be the max. Now, right along with that, let's talk domain and range because that's going to be coming up. So if negative 7 is your maximum, what does that say about your range? Your range then, remember your range is your y values, so your range is going to go from negative infinity up to negative 7, and that would have a square bracket because it does equal negative 7 at the vertex. Okay, your domain, which I kind of did these backwards, but your domain is all the possible x values, that's just going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, any x value will work. And you all know that parabolas, although they point up or down, generally speaking, when your x is squared, they do anyway, um, they also keep getting a little fatter all the time. Okay, a little wider. So that essentially, if they keep going on forever, it goes from negative infinity to infinity on the x axis. But the range goes from negative infinity up to negative 7, which is a maximum. Okay, I hope that jogged some memory. So now let's keep going. Um, I want to look at number five here, and I'm going to do some calculations here, completing the square, to get that in standard form. Okay, now that's not necessarily what they're asking. I know uh, what they're asking below the graph, you could actually just use the graph to plug in. But I want to show you the process because some of the ones coming later, you can't get nice, neat integer answers for the coordinates of points. So you need to be able to do that algebraically. So on number five, I'm just going to show you, or again, remind you, I guess, since we have already seen this, how I would complete the square on this quadratic. So if you remember the process of completing the square, any term that is your leading coefficient other than a positive 1 has to be factored out. Like we can't have anything right in front of the x squared. So that negative 1, I would be factoring out the negative just from the 2x terms. Okay, it's like you're dividing the a out of the two x terms, so the x squared and the x. So this would give me x squared, and then that would change my sign of my x term if I factor out the negative. And then the minus 3 is hanging out the back. Now, I intentionally left a space here, and I've got a space there that I need to fill in when I complete the square. So again, first step is to factor out the a, your leading coefficient, out of the two x terms. Okay, leave your constant hanging out the back of the parentheses. Okay, so again, um, that also then changes the sign of my 4x from positive to negative because I factored out the negative. Now, if you remember completing the square, you take half of the b term. That's your magic number, if you all remember us talking about this. So half of negative 4 is negative 2. You then square negative 2, which gives you positive 4. That is what gets put in in this empty spot, is positive 4. Okay. Now, we have to account for that in the blank behind the negative 3. But here's what we have to be careful of. Um, I put a plus 4 in here on the, the blank, Okay. But I've still got this negative that's factored out in front. So actually, what I added was a negative 4. So what needs to go here to counterbalance it is a positive 4. Okay, Because of that negative, remember that negative is actually distributed to this term as well. So the net effect of me putting a plus 4 in the parentheses is actually a negative 4. So to counterbalance that, since I'm on one side of the equation, I've got to add a positive 4. So this is going to now factor down to, I've got the negative out front. This is x minus 2 squared plus 1. Okay, This gives me the plus 1. And this is what I factored to get down to here. Okay, So 
this term right here will always be what goes in here will always be half of your B term. Always. Those will always be the same number. Half of the B term, half of the coefficient that's on the X is what goes in there when you're factoring. So that is quadratic standard form. Okay, so what does this tell us? This tells us my A is a negative one, so it opens down. And it tells me my vertex is going to be a two comma one. That's what that tells me. Okay, and we can see that from the graph. On this, obviously, my vertex here is a two comma one. Well, I found that algebraically. You can also see it graphically. Now, the other thing they're going to be asking us to find are x-intercepts and y-intercepts. Okay, so x-intercepts. How do we find x-intercepts? Well, the whole premise behind an x-intercept is that is where it crosses the x-axis. Well, what's true when something hits the x-axis is that y is zero. So essentially, we are setting the original function, negative x squared plus 4x minus 3, we are setting it equal to zero. Okay? So I'm going to now divide out the negative. And when I divide out the negative, zero divided by negative 1 is still just zero. So the negative, I just changed all the signs. This actually factors to minus 3 minus 1. Okay? So then if I solve this, this tells me x equals positive 3, and this tells me x equals positive 1. Well, lo and behold, what do you notice here? My x-intercepts. This is a 3. This is a 1. So the ordered pairs are actually 3, 0 and 1, 0. Those are the ordered pairs of my x-intercepts. And you can see that from the graph. Well, now what about y-intercepts? Well, y-intercepts are even easier because to solve for your y-intercept, you set x equal to 0. So let me just make note up here. To solve for your x-intercept, you set y equal to 0. To solve for your y-intercept, you set x equal to 0. Okay, so again, go back up to your original equation. So if you've got y equals negative 0 squared plus 4 times 0 minus 3, what's that going to equal? Okay, well, this is 0 plus 0 <laughs> minus 3. So obviously, y equals negative 3. So what does that make my y-intercept? My y-intercept then is a 0, negative 3. So here's an x-intercept. Here's an x-intercept. Here's my y-intercept. And they don't give us enough of the graph, but if I extended this, okay, my y-intercept would be at a negative, sorry, 0, negative 3. I almost wrote it in the wrong order. Okay, that would be my y-intercept. Again, all of this should be a review. We did all of this in Algebra 2, but I know it's been a while, so I thought I would go through some things. Also, on this parabola, one more thing they ask down below. What would be the maximum or minimum value? First of all, this would be a maximum. Okay, That is definitely a maximum. And what's the value? When they talk about a maximum value, they're always talking about the y value. So the maximum actually equals 1. Okay, it is a maximum and it equals one. Now, if they ask you the point that shows the maximum, then you give them the ordered pair. But if all they're asking for is the maximum or minimum value, that's the y value. Okay, always. Um, okay, that covers that one. I hope going through the process of completing the square, I'm going to do it a couple other times, but I hope that jogs some memories. Okay and allows you to answer some of these a little easier. Now, um, skipping the next one, I want to do number seven. Again, because we're going to have to um, do some work here to complete the square. So it says the graph of a quadratic function is given. And this one, you are going to have to do some work because um, we don't get nice, neat integer values for our ordered pairs. Okay, you can tell there by the graph that 
like where it crosses the x-axis is not on an integer okay so let's first complete the square okay so Again, we've got to divide out the A term, that's the leading coefficient, out of the two terms that have X in them. Got to divide it out. So I have pulling my 2 out front. That gives me X squared minus 2X. Again, I'm leaving a blank. And my minus 2, I'm leaving outside of the parentheses. Okay, and again, I'm leaving those holes on purpose. So I just factored the 2 out of the first two terms x squared minus 2x after you pull the 2 out and then the minus 2 is hanging out the back now again got to look for the magic number okay the magic number you take one half of negative 2 which is negative 1 okay then you square it square negative 1 and you get positive 1 so now this is where it gets interesting so i'm going to add a 1 here that's what i need in order to get a perfect square trinomial but how do I account for that? How do I keep the equation balanced, if you will, on the other side, behind the negative 2 there in the back? Well, because I factored a 2 out of the front, 2 times 1, what I actually did by adding a plus 1 inside the parentheses is I actually added a 2 to the right side of the equation. Well, to counterbalance that, since I added a positive 2, I've got to subtract 2 out here to balance it out because again we're on the same side of the equation okay so if i add a positive 2 on the left part then i've got to subtract 2 on the right part to balance it out okay i hope you all see that so now this factors okay so this whole thing right here factors to x minus 1 squared. How do I know that's a minus 1? Because what's in here will always be half of your b term. Okay, those will always be the same. And I've still got my 2 out front, and then out back now I have minus 4. Minus 2, minus 2. So my vertex, well first of all my a equals 2. So it's going to be a parabola pointing up, which you can obviously see from the graph. And then my vertex is going to be 1 comma negative 4. Does that match with my graph? Okay, you bet. That's the point 1 comma negative 4. That's my vertex. Okay. Um, let me also just to kind of show you where things came from there. Okay, um, now this is a minimum, okay? So this point is also a minimum. And my minimum here, okay, remember is always your y value. So my minimum is negative 4. So what this tells me is the range of this function, my domain is always going to be negative infinity to infinity. My range for this function would be negative 4 up to infinity. That would be my range for the function. Okay. Now, they also want x and y intercepts. Okay. X and y intercepts. I need a little more space here, so I'm going to erase this. Let me write it off to the side. So vertex was 1, negative 4. Um, x intercepts. Remember, how do I find x intercepts? I set y equal to 0. So this gives me 0 equals 2x squared minus 4x minus 2. Okay, divide everything by 2. So, and I'm going to kind of flip-flop here. So x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. Just divided everything by 2 and flip-flop my signs because I like the 0 on the right. Really doesn't matter. Everybody okay with that? Now. I'm going to complete the square, okay, again. So I'm going to pull my 1. Now I'm working with two different sides of the equation. So I'm going to leave this blank, pull my 1 over. Okay, add the 1 and move it over. Now, completing the square, once again, 
half of the B term. So this is just like the one above it. Half of the B term squared is going to be a plus one that goes in there. Well, now I've got two different sides of the equation. So if I add a plus one on the left, then I'm adding a plus one on the right to balance it out. Again, up above when I completed the square, I was working on one side of the equation. So if I added a two, I had to subtract a two on the same side. Now I've got two different sides of the equation. So I added a one on the left, add one on the right. So then this factors down to x minus one squared equals two. Okay, now square root procedure. Okay, do you all remember the square root procedure? If I square root both sides, what do I have to be careful of? That plus minus. Okay, so this now gives me x minus 1 equals plus or minus root 2. So then add the 1 over. I'm going to move it kind of to the left here for some more room. So x equals 1 plus or minus root 2. Now, it says, when it says, find the coordinates of the vertex and the x and y intercepts, round your answers to one decimal place. You're actually going to need to poke this in a calculator. One plus root two and one minus root two. So one plus root two gives me about 2.4. So my x-intercept would be 2.4 comma zero. That would be my x-intercept. Okay. One minus root two gives me about negative 0.4 if you poke that in the calculator okay so that would give me negative 0.4 comma zero that would be my other x-intercept and again you can kind of tell here 2.4 and negative 0.4 okay that's where it's crossing the x-axis now how do i find my y-intercept, I'm going to go over here for y-intercept. My y-intercept, remember the process, is you set x equal to 0. Essentially, it's always going to be your constant. Okay, so if I plug zeros in for all my x's, I get y equals 2 times 0 squared minus 4 times 0 minus 2. y just equals negative 2. Does that make sense with where it crosses the y-axis? Looks like it to me. So my y-intercept is a 0, negative 2. So this one was the 2.40. This one was the negative 0 0.40. This point right here was the 0, negative 2. x and y-intercepts. Okay. All right, Whew, I think I did enough on that one. Again, just wanting to jog memories here of quadratics and everything we can get from them. Okay, moving on here. Whoops. I think the next one I did was nine. Let me take a look at nine. Okay, I just want to start nine because it looks a little weird. Um, nine, notice we don't have a constant, um, but I still need to get that in standard form. Okay, so if I'm going to complete the square on this, again, I'm going to pull out the negative. So I've got x squared minus 12x. I have to change the sign. And then I don't have a constant hanging out behind the parentheses, so I'm just going to have the blank that I'm going to use to balance it. Okay, so once again, half of negative 12, okay, negative 12 times a half is negative 6. Negative 6 squared is 36. Okay, now again, this negative that I factored out out front applies to the 36. So what I really added was a negative 36. So to balance it, I've got to have plus 36 hanging out the back. Okay, so now what's in the parentheses here? This factors, got the minus out front, it's going to be x minus 6 squared 
plus 36. That would be the standard form. Okay, right here. I hope that makes sense. Okay, remember that this number in here is always going to be half of the B term. It's going to be the same as that number there. Okay, that's all I wanted to do on that one. Um, the next one, I want to help you set up the um, completing the square because we're going to end up with some ugly fractions and I want you to see them so you're not scared of them. Um, okay, so this one, once again, we have to factor out the A term, the leading coefficient from the two terms that have X. So first thing I'm going to do is pull the 2 out of the first two terms. Well, that leaves me with x squared. Now that leaves me with 1 half x. And again, I'm going to have a blank and then my minus 6 in the back with another blank. Okay, I have to complete the square. So um, now remember, to find that magic number, we take 1 half of the B term. Well, one half of one half is one fourth. So then I square one fourth and I get one sixteenth. So I'm adding one sixteenth in here. Now, here's where it, it gets a little dicey. Um, because of this two that I factored out, what I actually added here was two sixteenths or one eighth. Okay, so I added technically a 2 sixteenths or a 1 eighth. So to balance that outside the parenthesis, I have to subtract 1 eighth. Okay, so when I added the 1 sixteenth inside the parenthesis, because the 2 is outside the parenthesis, what I actually added was 2 sixteenths or 1 eighth. So I have to add the inverse of that negative 1 eighth on the outside. Okay, well then this is going to look like the 2 is still outside. This factors to x plus 1 fourth squared. And then negative 6 would be what? Negative 48 eighths minus 1 would be negative 49 eighths. Okay, now again, just a reminder, this 1 fourth comes from the number here. Okay, those are the same. This then is my standard form. Okay, um, that's all I'll do on that one. Um, looking back through, I'm not going to do all of these, but again, I wanted to touch base on some of them. I now want to go to number 14. Number 14 here. I should have used the scroll on the right side. Okay, find the maximum or minimum value of the function. Um, this one, I, I, I want to remind you that we also, instead of completing the, the square, we also have the, um, the vertex formula, okay? So, the, the vertex formula, if you remember, what the formula for that is x equals negative b over 2a, and the y equals the value of the function at that point. Okay, so first we find the x value, negative b over 2a, then we plug that value into the function to find the y. The corresponding y value, and that gives us the x and y of our vertex. So for instance, um, on this one, and we could divide by 2 to get rid of the big numbers, but this is my a, this is my b, this would be my c. I don't really need c for this one. Um, but first thing that jumps out at me is that my a is positive. If my a is positive, that means my parabola is going to point up. Am I going to have a maximum value on my vertex or a minimum? I'm going to have a minimum, right? So if my parabola points up, 
that means my range is going to be from whatever my y value of my vertex is up to infinity. That's a minimum. Okay, now to find that maximum or minimum value, again, you could complete the square and jump through all the hoops, or you can use vertex formula. So my x equals negative b over 2a, that's negative 40 over 2 times 10. So negative 40 over 20 negative 2. Okay, well now that I know what x is, my y is going to equal f of negative 2. Now you literally plug this value into the function in place of the x to figure out what your max or min is. Okay, so this is going to be 10 times negative 2 squared plus 40 times negative 2 plus 118. Okay, well, this is 10 times 4, and this is going to give me negative 80 plus 118, yada, yada, yada. You'd have negative 40, 78. Okay, that is my minimum, is a 78. Okay, so we can complete the square to get it in standard form. We also have the vertex formula to kind of quickly just find the vertex if that's all I needed. If all I needed was the vertex, and if they're just asking for max and min, that is truly all you need, then you can use the vertex formula. Okay, just wanted to remind you of that. Um, Okay, now I want to take a look at number 17 because it says on 17 and 18 that a graphing calculator is recommended. So, of course, in lieu of a graphing calculator, everyone's favorite math program is Desmos. So, that's what we're going to use. So, a couple of things I wanted to point out here. They give us the function, okay? If we go to graph that in Desmos, what we're looking for is a local max and a local min. Now, First thing that jumped out at me when I looked at that um, function, it's a cubic function. If you remember, your odd-powered or odd-degree functions have the tails going opposite ways, okay? If this right here would be, well, this right here would be my leading coefficient of negative 1. So typically, a regular cubic, if I have the x cubed function, if I'm graphing it, it kind of looks like this. Okay, but if it's a negative, okay, the tails are flip-flopped, so it kind of looks like that. Okay, so that's kind of what this is going to look like. Now, if you have a cubic function that looks like this, local maxes and local mins are going to be at the bottom of a trough and the top of a hill, if you will, in the middle of the function. This right here would be a local max. And they mean local because it's not the ultimate max. The ultimate max is infinity, okay? Because the left-hand side goes all the way up. Um, but this right here would be what we call a local min. And again, it's local because it's not a minimum for the whole function because the minimum is negative infinity. It keeps going on forever. But those are what we call local maxes and local mins, okay? And I want to point out that this is your y value when they're asking for local max and min values, those are your y values, okay? And then they're asking you when they occur at x equals whatever. So let me jump to Desmos. I already have this in. So looky there, here's my function in Desmos. Everyone loves Desmos because it gives us these little gray dots at the important parts of the function. So this would be my local max. Okay, my local max would be 7 at the point x equals 1. That's what they're getting at. The local max equals 7. It's always your y value at the point x equals 1. And then this one, I don't really need the y-intercept. This one over here we have to be careful of because this one would be a local min Okay, and if I remember correctly, the uh, problem said to round to two decimal places. So this would be the local min, and that would equal 5.8. Now, you might have to play a little. If you notice here, it's 815. 
but we don't know if the five has rounded up or down. Okay, so we don't know what was behind the five is what I'm getting at. This might have been a four seven. Well, if that was a four, then that would be 5.81. If not, if that was like a five three or something, that would be 5.82. So you have to play a little bit. So I would try a five one first. If that doesn't work, then try 5.82, okay? So again, Desmos, it rounds to three places. Since they want us to round to two, I would try either a 0.81 or a 0.82, okay? Because we don't know how the five got to be there, whether it rounded. And then again, that would be at the point X equals negative 0.33. There's no ambiguity there. Okay, so it's only if that third decimal place is a five that you kind of wonder if the second decimal place needs to round up or down because you don't know how the five got there, if it was rounded or not. Okay. Um, last couple I want to point out on your homework. And then we're almost done. I know this was long, but... Um, I want to do that. Oh, well, first, let me just say on this number 19, um, it says, what is the maximum height attained by the ball? So essentially what they're talking about is if they throw something up, okay, notice that your leading coefficient's negative. So we're talking about an upside down parabola. This, what you're looking for really is your vertex, okay? They want the maximum height the ball reached. So like this is ground level. I guess I don't really need arrows. This is ground level. We throw a ball up, it reaches a maximum height before it comes down. Okay, so you're looking for the Y coordinate of your vertex. That's what they're asking for. Okay. All right, um, on 20, this one's pretty straightforward, but because it's a word problem, I know I'll get questions. Um, so we have 1,400 feet of fencing to fence in a rectangular horse corral, yada, yada, yada. Really, the 1,400 has nothing to do with this, um, really. So our area here, they want the area of the corral. Well, they give us the length and they give us the width. So what do we think area is going to be? X times 700 minus X, which is... 700x minus x squared. That's our area. That's not exactly rocket science. Okay. Now, find the dimensions of the rectangle that maximize the area of the corral. Again, think about this in terms of a graph. Okay. Think about it in terms of a graph. This is an upside down or a pointing down parabola. Again, this is my leading coefficient. So I know the parabola points down. Okay. So if I've got this parabola, Okay, we're talking about maximum area. So we are looking at what are the dimensions, the width and the length that's going to get me to my vertex. Well, essentially, find your x coordinate of your vertex. Okay, so your x would equal negative 700 over 2 times negative 1, which is 350. Okay, X is your width. Okay, this would be 350 feet for the width. So then how do you find out, of course, that's where the dead spots are on my board. How would you find out the length? I'll leave that up to you guys. Okay, but that's essentially what they're asking us is your vertex. Okay, again, if you think of the equation in terms of its graph, of its parabola, the maximum area is going to be at the top of that parabola. Well, what's my vertex there? Okay. All right. So this concludes, wow, 40 minutes almost. Um, this concludes section 3.1. Again, this should technically be a review from Algebra 2, but I know it's been a year or so. So um, anyway, hope this helped. Hope it jogged your memory. Okay. Again, pay attention to due dates on WebAssign. All right.